Welcome home. This is Audio EXP for the 19th of June 2021. And the title of this episode is Should This Have Been a Secret D&D Project? How Things Can Change. Last week's podcast, which was the 100th episode of Geek Native's Highlight Show, talked about whether or not the two D&D leaks, Strixhaven and Witchlight, were that much of a leak. The notion was twofold. Firstly, the Amazon listings timing revealed two of the three forthcoming D&D books had to happen to keep a timetable that Wizards of the Coast were managing. And secondly, the book's descriptions were unusual in that they pointed D&D fans away from Watsy own media and towards the boat media via the Comcast G4 partnership. Whether you agree with the media strategy of outsourcing D&D Live, it is an undisputable fact that those signposts to the event were placed there in time for the so-called leak. So last week, we talked as if Watsy had a plan. It, it started okay. d d studio boss, Ray Winninger, let us know that there was still one more book to come and that Wizards of the Coast were exploring all new physical formats. And maybe they do, but it's not gone well this week. All new formats would be one bold promise, but all new physical formats sets quite a high bar. So what on earth could they be? I wrote a blog post to speculate. Firstly, and perhaps the least important, is a guess to what the third book could be. Many people are guessing the Draconomicon as an old but significant and non-setting book that might sell well. As a Hail Mary on the format, I mentioned AR books, in part because videos showing those look cool and because it works with D&D books, which you hold in your hand and yet you could use virtual tabletop integration with. And this seems like a sweet spot for Hasbro to own. Then, to move to safety, I suggested new books such as the pretty hardback A5 format that we're seeing from some of the bolder Challenger Studios. Or perhaps a subscription model. If you are a long-time listener, you know my mind often goes there. It's all about predictable revenue streams. I also talked about physical virtual tabletops. That sounds like a contradiction in terms, but I imagine a hardware device that lays flat on your tabletop and which, at the very least, shows virtual maps on the flat screen. That enables those profitable physical minis that Hasbro wants to sell and remote play and a marketplace. It's also augmented reality of a sort. At about the same time, Pokemon Go makers Niantic announced a new game. They are making an augmented reality game called Transformers Heavy Metal. And of course, Hasbro have the license. So if you know Ingress or Pokemon Go, then you'll get the idea. You get to walk up to a place and have a mini screen tapping adventure there. I couldn't but help speculate that D&D would make a more complex, but potentially far more addictive and therefore lucrative AR game in this model. Imagine walking up to a hidden dungeon entrance in your hometown and battling the guardians or controlling the area at the expense of a rival guild. At about the same time, Wizards of the Coast Supremo Chris Cox reminded Trade Press that the future of D&D was digital and that many more computer games are coming. Of course, this is old news to Geek Native listeners, but the timing is important. Then, the final piece snaps into place. Wizards of the Coast had used social media to push a survey. Of course, they've done this before. And when they said, help shape the future of Dungeons and Dragons, it looked like the usual hyperbole from marketing, right? However, some people answering the survey, and it looks like people who spent most money got invited into a secret section. Two things happened. People objected to the language that was pretty threatening and promised repercussions if people leaked the secretive sensitive parts. And since that threat seemed to be made before anyone had promised to keep the secrets, it hit social media. And that's how we know there was a secret project underway. Then, as you can expect, despite those threats, and perhaps because of them, people leaked what was in the secret part. Now, I didn't 
qualify, so I can't confirm any of this with my own experiences. But two things seem clear. Watsy are considering a subscription model, and they have a virtual tabletop to show people. It remains to be seen how far off my own speculations about subscriptions and whether the physical virtual tabletop is the innovative piece that Chris Cox, the future of D&D, with uh, Winninger's never-seen-before-physical format comic can combine. Nevertheless, Hasbro is one of the few companies in a position of such power to try this. And if they don't, startups are moving into the space anyway. On Geek Native, there's now an unofficial poll. If you missed the official survey or not, please take part. The headline question is this. Would you buy your D&D books all over again for an official virtual tabletop? Let me explain. Many people have bought D&D Beyond books because that was the digital format promoted by Wizards. But that's not a Hasbro company and not yet a virtual tabletop. People may have also bought Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds official D&D because they are virtual tabletops and have the integrated rule set. However, to integrate with the new Wizards of the Coast VTT, then you may also need Watsy virtual tabletop compatible digital assets, and perhaps via a subscription. And that might mean rebuying your books. It's early days, but the stats in the Geek Native survey are public, and I can tell you that most people think it is a good idea for Wizards of the Coast to have a virtual tabletop but most people have no plans on buying D&D 5e all over again. So that naturally leads to the question, should this be a D&D 6e project? In the survey, most listeners think not, but it's early days and just a few votes can change the shape of the results. So please share it around and take part. You can find the link via the show notes. Now, There's absolutely a tabletop RPG that Hasbro is making sweeping changes to and, as a result, being removed from my marketplace. And that game is Hero Quest. There have been two Hero Quests in recent pasts. One, a board game, and a role-playing game by Chaosium. Chaosium ended up controlling all the trademarks through cleverness and patience. So, when big-budget Hasbro wanted to bring the Hero Quest board game back, for a very successful crowdfunding, they had to cut a deal. Chaosium sold the rights and announced their hero quest would rebrand to Quest Worlds. It is time for the action on that promise to happen, and in about a month, the old hero quest products will vanish. So if you want an RPG from Chaosium that says hero quest, then you need to buy it now. If not, you can buy them later when they're called Quest Worlds. And since we're talking about an old RPG and a legal use of the name, let's talk about Spelljammer Adventures in Space. Spelljammer is absolutely a candidate for one of the old D&D settings that Wizards of the Coast are looking at bringing back. However, Spelljammer Adventures in Space is a fan-made conversion and it asserts it is within Hasbro's fan policy. I blogged about it this week and it's been a popular thing to talk about on Twitter there's clearly an appetite for the game. In this case, I think the fan-made conversion does very well, and it's a free download. Furthermore, there's a Discord for the game to go chill, chat, and ask questions. It's worth checking out. Geeknator's own Discord is ticking along too. I've not been banging the drum, but new members are coming in at a slow and steady pace nevertheless. You will find way more trailers and competitions there. It's also worth talking about Twilight 2000 while we're discussing old, new games. You can buy Twilight 2000 version 1 now as a download good quality scan of the 1984 original. It's a game with some hardcore fans and which was set in the alternative year 2000 after the Twilight War went nuclear. In the RPG, you're now ex-military trying to survive in a world that was once Central Europe. You can buy version 1 or, as of this week, you can pre-order Twilight 2000 from Free League Publishing and get the latest version. The successful Swedish studio ran an awesome Kickstarter for the game. I saw lots of hype and enthusiasm for it. And the pre-order bundle looks so physical and so well produced. 
I'm sure people will be eager to get their gaming mitts on it. I had time this week, surprisingly, to track out two small, new and interesting RPGs. There's Wendy Wise, Marvelous Mutations and Merry Musicians. The RPG is set after the end of the world, when war is forgotten, but danger is not. It's when civilization is rebuilding, and yet all sorts of mutants crawl the wastelands. Live music is cherished, and you will play a mutant musician using the rule, do whatever you want, and then deal with the consequences. In terms of game mechanics, those consequences are tags on your character sheet. So name your price download from itch.io, and it looks fresh and exciting. Pages are like art. Guy Schlanders of How to Be a Great Game Master also has a new game out via Kickstarter. It's called Bounty Hunter, and it doesn't use dice. Dropping the dice in favour of a point system is dramatic. It turns the RPG into something of an action economy where planning is rewarded and the fickle whims of fate can do very little about it. The stated goal of the Kickstarter for Bounty Hunter was to create the easiest tabletop RPG ever. It's not, but it is pretty easy. Bounty Hunter has rules with spaceships, and I think straight away that means it was never going to be the most straightforward game. But I enjoy having this rock-solid approach to space in my collection. It's not unusual at all for sci-fi RPGs not to have spaceship or space combat rules. A Bounty Hunter gives me a system that can go anywhere, because it doesn't need or care about the game engine that you might be using outside the battle. I also had a chat of, with Chamomile of Chamomile Has Adventures this week, and I was pretty impressed. The name has been popping up on my Kickstarter radar for a while, and there's a reason for that. Chamomile is doing 12 Kickstarters in 12 months, and so far they've all been successful, becoming even more successful as the news spreads. And so far, each project is delivered pretty much on schedule, and Kickstarter should be happy that there's no dangerous overlap between promises being offered and promises yet fulfilled. We talked about the Kickstarter for Thamen's Guides to Gods and Miracles, and that's a 5e e sign, and find out that the next one will be Kellywin's Guide to the Wilderness and Fae. Well, probably. The trick to the success, or some of it, is to be flexible. The free download Pathfinder Arena rules are a contrast, but not in a negative way. This is a Pathfinder competitive skirmish game that Pazio are making with an Italian company called Geochi. Your heroes battle in the arena, but not directly, by summoning monsters. And this turns into a miniature game proposition. I think we first heard about it in October 2020. And while the draft rules are available now, and the links are in the usual place, the crowdfunding campaign for it has not yet started. They've not even announced a platform for it. But by raising that as a thing, it makes me think it might not be Kickstarter. And the stars aligned this week as well, as I was able to publish the RPG spotlight on Samurai Sheepdog ahead of the Friday newsletter. They've been making stuff for Pathfinder, but not exclusively so, and they're seeing positive signs with the pickup of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. You may know Samurai Sheepdog as a different name, although the two companies are separate. Do you remember Mystic Eye Games? They date back to the D20 era. That's a rule system that D&D 3 and 3.5 used in a pre-Kickstarter time in which publishers published whatever they wanted. It happened en masse, and weirdly, despite the challenges, it happened with much less filtering, because there wasn't that pledge target that so many would-be efforts face today. Mystic Eye Games was part of that, and stood out in my memory by pushing in new directions while not reinventing the wheel and taking only sensible size steps to get there. I often wonder what had happened. Now, for legal reasons, the Samurai Sheepdog article skirts around those. Uh, those legal reasons are my own. I don't like to push particular doors. We are told that Mystic Eye Games closed after problems with the distributor. And when I hear of distribution problems from that time, I think of a company called Ossium. Chris Pramas of Green Ronin once told me that Osseus stole 100,000 from them. Mystic Eye Games, reads the article, had the worst luck with logistics and the company that provides them. 
I think the word samurai is perhaps fitting for the new company, as it gives me images of fighters with honour, although I know historically it was more complicated than that. And as a reminder, the RPG Publisher Spotlight is a monthly poll that patrons can vote on, and the candidates for July are live on the site now. So become a patron and vote for your favourite. It's a way to help small creators. Geek Native is not the only place to help small publishers, though. For example, in a mid-month fandom events calendar update, one which mentions Renegade Con Virtual Special Edition, I call out Small Press Day 2021. That event has been confirmed for the 14th of August, and while we're waiting on the details, it is a chance to support comic book creators, authors, and the wider creative publishing industry. Bundles, I hope, also support the industry. They are a chance for smaller publishers to get some limelight on a more extensive marketplace. So let's take a look at the four bundles that slid onto the radar this week. Bloat Games' Dark Places and Demigorgons is in the bundle of holding, along with Vigilante City. I've played neither, but I've heard good things about both. Also worth noting, the recent Kickstarter Survive This is included, and like the others, it's a game about surviving 80s style horror. Another offering in the bundle of holding is Black Scrolls Map Tiles. Now these are high quality files, and if you go for the full collection, you will need 4.5 gigabytes of memory to store them all. I must admit, I hope this is partly due to the volume of mats, and not just the definition of the files, because I'm sure many VTTs have an upload limit on size. Also threatening to eat your hard drive space, but a worthy offering from Hundle Bundle is one from GamesAid and a group of British computer game publishers. The first game is just 70p. And lastly, and in the determined hope that the convention scene will return, Humble also has the return of the cosplay collection. These are surely all the cosplay books you need to reach the next level. On that note, let's wrap there. Stay safe, stay in costume, and we'll see you next week.